I am McCool from McCool Risk Solutions. Today I'm with Jonathan Morris from Quantech Corp. Quantech is a company that specializes in cybersecurity. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Jonathan, in a few of our videos, you've mentioned the dark web. Um, can you tell us what that is? Well, if you think of the internet as an iceberg, what you see above the surface is what we call the surface web. Okay. These are all the public sites that people use every day. Just below the surface is an area that we call the deep web. Okay. This is not necessarily a bad place. The deep web, it's usually sites that are more secured, require some type of authentication in order to access the information. Dark web is at the very tip of the iceberg at the bottom. It's the place where illicit sites exist temporarily to exchange illicit information to compromise individuals and businesses. Okay. So now could I access the dark web or the deep web with my typical browser? Well, you can access the surface web and the deep web with okay. the browser. These are regular parts of the internet. The dark web is a different story. The dark web, the sites are not the same as a regular internet site. Okay. They're called onion sites, unlike .com or .net or .edu. These sites require a special browser to access, and the sites never exist very long on the dark web. Okay. Now, how big is the dark web? The dark web is projected to be about 900 times larger than the surface web. Wow. And that's largely because there are so many bad actors out there looking to mine information and exchange information for cryptocurrency to compromise you and your business. Okay. What is a bad actor? A bad actor is a hacker, or what we call a black hat. These are cyber criminals. Cyber crime is basically organized crime that's gone online. Okay. And what, what are some of the crimes that are appearing on the dark web? The most common crimes are the sale of weapons and the sale of identities, uh, commonly what we're seeing now is people exchanging passwords, email addresses, and the like in order to be able to impersonate you on any site that's on the internet. For example, any of the major breaches of any of the online organizations that you've heard about in the news, the information in those breaches is likely being sold on the dark web, not to harm the company, but to infiltrate you as an individual. Okay, and what do they hope to do when they infiltrate us as individuals? If I can impersonate you as an individual, I can pretty much compromise any aspects of your life because I can make the rest of the world believe that I'm you, even though I'm not. So you can basically steal my identity, use my credit cards, access my bank account. I can open up new bank accounts. Okay. I can open up new lines of credit. I can buy homes, or worse yet, I can steal your IRS refund. So it sounds like that information is valuable, so I'm going to assume it's very expensive to buy this information on the dark web. Ironically, the average price of an ID and a password on the dark web ranges between $1 and $8. Now, how can that be? Well, the volume of information that's available out there is, is enormous. Okay. And what happens is the attackers, depending on the volume of the information revealed from a data breach, they can set their own prices and the market sets its own demands. Okay. And the way they obtain this information is kind of what we've discussed before, that typical email where someone clicks on what they shouldn't, or what other ways do hackers have to obtain information? Well, there are a number of ways information can end up on the dark web, whether it's a compromise of a major organization, or it's simply a phishing scam where somebody clicks on a link in an email and you're taken to a web page where it will either infect your computer with a key logger to record what you type or ask you for an ID and password. If you type in that information, you're pretty much handing over your keys to the bad guys. And how can you tell if an email you receive is legitimate or not? Well, it's getting tougher and tougher these days for you to determine what emails are good and what are bad. You have to look very closely at the sender's address. You have to look at the grammar. And above all else, unfortunately, you have to remain skeptical these days of every message that you receive in your inbox. Okay. Jonathan was very helpful. Disturbing, but helpful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, our contact information will appear on the screen.